for another highlight of the service. I want you to sit back with an open heart and an open mind filled with love as we welcome to the give us this morning's message our beloved pastor, John the Beloved. Welcome to the podium. Not the podium. So I was so talking about the little girl, her name was Patricia. 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 And, and she was she the was first, first child, child to be discovered, to be discovered with, HIV with HIV in, in Jamaica. Jamaica. And, she was, and she was discovered by an off-the-wall risk takeover woman called Dr. Pat Burke, who actually started the whole HIV research um, in Jamaica back in early early 80s, 80 or 81. I was trying to remember her name. I think it's Patricia. Uh, you remember her, Carmen, right? Well, Patricia was in a, a special unit at the university hospital set up by Dr. Burke for, um, for children with HIV. And I said to her one Christmas back in the 80s, what can I get for Patricia? And she said, oh, John, I have an idea. It would be so lovely. I'll get permission for you to take her out um, and you can take her shopping so she, so she can choose her own gift. And so being a high risk taker myself, I went to the university, picked up the little one, and we went shopping. Now, my friends, I want you to know that I had my mind full of all kinds of wonderful things I could get her, you know. But nothing I showed her interested her. I said, oh my goodness, look at this dress. Wow, we kazawi. Would you like to try it on? Mm -mm. Oh then, look at this teddy bear. He's bigger than you. Would you like to take him home back to the, um, the ward so that you can cuddle him at night to go to sleep? Mm -mm. Walking a little further. I know just the thing for you. What about this pair of red patent leather shoes for Christmas? The response? Mm-mm. You know what brought the light to her eyes and the delight to her little heart? <laughs> the one thing that irritated me about Christmas in those days, the Salvation Army kettles with that little bell that rang incessantly. I just didn't like them. So much so that I would, I would give clothes and whatever to the Salvation Army headquarters, but I wouldn't ever put money in those kettles. I just found it very irritating. What did Patricia want to do? We had to stop at every kettle and drop her money. Drop her money, Uncle John. Said I would try to head her off if I saw one down, a little way down the plaza and say, let's go into the shop. She would tug at my hand and say, no, there's a kettle. And after about six kettles, <laughs> I, I, I said in desperation, Look here, we won't have any money left to buy you a present. And that the first kettle she had said to the attendant, the, uh, the gentleman standing there, a kindly gentleman, is your pot full? So he said, I hope it will be because it's going to make Christmas merry for all the little children who don't have a daddy looking at me to take them walking in the plaza and shopping for Christmas. So that did it for her. I mean, that was now her motivation that every Salvation Army kettle should get our money. And so we walked and we dropped money until she was tired, I was exhausted, and we stopped to have something to eat. But she cured me that little picnic of my dislike of those Salvation Army people outside every supermarket and every pharmacy and every store. And by the way, I bought her a hula hoop. Cost nothing, you know. And her delight was not so much in trying it herself, but as watching me <laughs> trying to show her how to wine. Anyway, that hula hoop will have a bearing on part of the assignment I'm going to give you today, but more of that later. Um, <laughs> but you know, friends, just think about it. Every time you wish somebody Merry Christmas or send a greeting or give or receive a gift, you are really celebrating your own birth of truth. 
your own awakening, that stirring within you of good. And I want you to just think of yourself as reliving the Christmas story, that tender, tender story of so long ago. And it doesn't matter to me whether it was actually in December that Jesus was born or, um, you know, any of that. What matters is the message that the master teacher brought. And that message was that we too can give birth to the Christ. That each of us, in a very real sense, is the son or daughter of God. And that when we embrace that, the word, our word, our thoughts, our beingness becomes flesh and dwells in the world even as that precious little child, Jesus the way Shoa did so many, many years ago. And it's just amazing to me that if we can just again become as little children to capture the, the wonder and the, the beauty and the mystery and the excitement of this festive season, um, we, could, we could really learn a, a, a huge transformative lesson about how we should be living our lives as bearers of the light and as students of the truth. There's another story of, you know, of a little girl, and it's told by her dad. Um, and it happened on a Christmas Eve, I don't know how long ago. But his name was Ted Thompson. And he wrote this story about a lesson he learned from his daughter, which I'd like to share with you. The year our youngest daughter, Shelley, was four, she received an unusual Christmas present from Santa. She was the perfect age for Christmas, he says, able to understand the true meaning of the season, but still completely enchanted by the magic of it. Her innocent joyfulness was compelling and catching, a gift to parents, reminding us of what Christmas should represent no matter how old we are. The most highly prized gift Shelley received that Christmas Eve was a giant bubble maker. A simple device of plastic and cloth, the inventor promised would create huge billowing bubbles large enough to swallow a wide-eyed four-year-old. Both Shelley and I were, were really excited about trying it out, but it was after dark, and so we knew we had to wait till the following day. Later that night, he says, I read the instruction booklet while Shelley played with some other of her new toys. The inventor of the bubble maker had tried all types of soaps for formulating bubbles and found that joy dishwashing liquid detergent created the best giant bubbles, I thought to myself, I'll have to buy some. The next morning, I was awakened very early by small stirrings in the house. Those of you that have children and grandchildren know that. You're just turning over for another little snuggle in, but you hear life stirring in the house, and you know somebody is up. And so he awakened and his little Shelley was up. He said, I knew in my sleepy mind that Christmas Day festivities would soon begin, so I arose and made my way toward the kitchen to start the coffee. In the hallway, I met my daughter, already wide awake, the bubble maker clutched in her chubby little hand. The magic of Christmas morning embraced in her four-year-old heart and her eyes shining with excitement as she asked, Daddy, can we make bubbles now? I sighed heavily and rubbed my eyes. I looked toward the window where the sky was only beginning to lighten with the dawn. I looked toward the kitchen where the coffee pot had yet to start dripping its aromatic reward for early rising Christmas dads. Oh, Shelley, I said, my voice almost pleading and perhaps a little annoyed. It's too early, honey, I haven't even had my coffee yet. 
Her smile fell away immediately, and I felt her father's remorse for bursting her bright Christmas bubble with what I suddenly realized was my own selfish problem, and my heart just broke a little. But I was a grown-up. I could fix this. In a flash of adult inspiration, I unshouldered the responsibility. Recalling the inventor's recommendation of a particular brand of bubble-making detergent, which I knew we did not have in the house, I laid the blame squarely on him. Pointing out gently, honey, besides, you have to have joy. I watched her eyes light back up as she realized in less than an instant that she could neutralize the small problem with the great and wonderful truth which she was about to reveal. Oh, daddy, she, she promised with all the honesty and enthusiasm and Christmas excitement she could possibly communicate. Oh, daddy, I do, I do have joy. I broke records getting to the store, and in no time at all, we were out on the front lawn creating gigantic billowing gossamer orbs, each one filled with joy and sent forth shimmering into the Christmas sun. He titled the story, Ode to Joy, O-W-E-D. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching known as the Science of Mind, writes, and I quote, We are celebrating this month not just the thought of the greatest man who ever graced this world with his presence, but the birth into the human consciousness, into each of us, of something transcendent and immediate and effective and available. The divine presence revealing itself to us directly personally, intimately. There is nothing that can hinder it but ourselves. The birth of something so beautiful, so tender, so, so transformative, so wholesome, so perfect, and personal to each and every one of us. Not just at Christmas time, but all year through. If we would just get ourselves out of the way and embrace the joy that comes from making of our hearts a manger so that there is room in the inn of our lives for the beauty of the cosmic Christ full of grace and truth. And so I want to suggest four really simple things that you can do to prepare your hearts and minds for the birth to a higher consciousness this Christmas. So it's a four-part a four assignment, but they're really very simple. First, whenever you find yourself involved in a discussion that is becoming predominantly negative, stop talking. Make no further comment until you can think of something to say that is both positive and specific. And then say it. It doesn't matter whether anyone else agrees with you. Your purpose is to make your mind as stable to welcome the Christ idea, the idea of your own divinity. And that is why what I loved about the appreciative inquiry approach which we took at our recently concluded summit, the approach to, to charting the way forward for our Temple of Light. Because instead of the litany of what's wrong that we so often tend to want to, to repeat, we looked with love and with joy and with excitement at what was good about our church, about our history, about where we are coming from. And we are using that consciousness of good as the foundation on which to build a temple of light that honors the memory of our founders and creates, seeks to achieve the vision of a work that, world, that really works for all. So just refuse to indulge in anything 
negative because the Christ cannot be born in a mind full of negatives. The Christ is born into a mind that really appreciates the beauty and the wonder and the joy that is expressed by little children watching an, an awkward uncle trying to do a hula hoop or a dad on the lawn blowing bubbles made with joy. Second, in the vein of, of appreciative consciousness, make a positive appreciative comment to two different people every day. You can comment on some aspect of the physical environment, it can be about the weather, the season, the beautiful sunset years. You can vary the step by commenting instead of that of that inspiring quality possessed by someone to whom you ordinarily give little thought. Because at this time, if you can just remind yourself that everybody has unsuspected depths of goodness, of godness, and that they are revealed in quite extraordinary ways. It may just be a little kid insisting on dropping a money in every Salvation Army kettle in a shopping plaza. What a consciousness of giving. What a consciousness of just wanting. You know, she said, I said, we can't keep on doing this. And she said, why can't we, Uncle John? It's for the children who don't have an Uncle John to walk them in the plaza. You know, after she said so, I, I, she could have gotten anything, my house, my, my you know, whatever she wanted. She, you know, when children do it to you, and they just put their hands in your heart and do this. Oh. So make a positive, appreciative statement to a couple of people this week. In the consciousness of gratitude for this beautiful time of year. And the third one will surprise you because it is it's the part of the assignment that relates to the hula hoop and, in fact, to the bubble. This week, I want you to look for circles. Just be conscious and mindful of the circles that you encounter this week. And just remember that an arc is part of a circle. And if you become mindful of that unbroken, that continuity, that, that wheel, you know, it's like, it's like eternal. It will remind you, I hope, of the eternality of life and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding into its spiritual magnificence. You may find it in a button or a bicycle tire, a bicycle wheel or the ring that you wear without even thinking about it. Or in a hula hoop. Or in a soap bubble blown by a little girl. Be aware of circles this Christmas. Because around it comes in this, this age, this amazing new age that we are experiencing, my friends. The glory of the Christ. And so out of this pandemic, we are indeed emerging and evolving into an amazing humanity that is reflecting and expressing our divinity, the truth of who we are, perfect God in perfect man and woman in a perfect world in a cycle, a circle, an unbroken, unending wheel of love of which each of us is a spoke and of which this church, your church, the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, is a hub from which love and compassion and peace and purity and goodwill and prosperity, and service, and all of the values that we, we, we treasure as human beings can emanate to touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love and liberate 
all mankind. And fourthly, I'm, I'm about to land, choose an idea that has universal meaning, such as love or truth or beauty or peace, any of those values that I just mentioned, and watch for expressions of this in your reading, in your associations. Look for it, too, in conversations that you have with people. Look for it in works of art, in nature, and most important of all, look for it in individuals as they are go, go about their daily activities. Look for love, my friends. It is there in all people. Look for peace, my friends. It is there in the depths of all people. Look for purity. Look for honesty. Look for truth. Look for integrity. Look for God. And whatever you conceive God to be in the hearts and minds and consciousness of your fellow human beings. My friends, this Christmas, as we seek to stay connected with maintaining, while maintaining physical distance, let us set our intention to allow the Christ principle of sonship to direct our thinking and our affairs. Know right now for yourself and for every other self that we really are immortal beings on the pathway of an eternal destiny. And so my wish for you all is the realization of this truth so that you may each find in the inner of your life the Christ power, peace, purity, and joy, the light that surrounded the shepherds of old beaming around you as you make yourself a worthy manger to receive the beauty of Christmas. Because the truth, as Isaiah put it, is unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of peace. Namaste.